Okay, so in parasitic relationships, one species is harmed, one species benefits. Here's the key. Parasites don't usually kill their hosts. Parasites would actually prefer not to kill their hosts. At least not very fast. <laughs> not on purpose. Parasites can kill their hosts. Yeah, these are all the really gross pictures, I'm going to warn you. They know where their meal ticket is. You don't kill the thing that's feeding you. So we've got a couple different parasites here. We'll talk more about these little lovelies right here. Those are pinworms. About 20% of the human species is infected with them at any one time. Pinworms. Little kids are really prone to them. No, pinworms. They're not ring ringworm is actually a fungal <coughs> infection. They're not a real worm. Um, this is a botfly larva. Cows get them all the time. My barn cats used to get botflies all the time. I'm a pro at removing botfly larvae. I have a method. Um, and if you feel really brave, you can Google search botfly removal. Um, you'll come up with awesome stuff. Don't do it now. Do it on your own time. But it's lots of fun. So there are two big categories of parasites. We talk about ectoparasites that live on the outside. And these are the things that, you know, leeches and ticks and fleas. Um, they stay on the outside. A lot of them are blood suckers. They tend to not be all that specialized. Leeches will as, as happily take your blood as a turtle's blood. Um, fleas will bite you, your dog, your cat, a coyote, a fox. They'll bite anything. Um, there are some mites that are pretty host specific, like there are bird mites that you can get on your chickens and you can find them on wild birds. Um, but like mosquitoes will suck any warm blood. You got warm blood, mosquito will bite you. Whether you're dog, cat, cow, person, camel, goat, elk, doesn't matter, they'll bite you. Again, they tend to not be all that specialized. On the other hand, these conversations always make everybody's head itch. We can have parasites that live inside hosts. And these guys tend to be a little bit more specialized. So these are endos, um, endoparasites. So tapeworms, that is a tapeworm in a human gut right there. That's somebody's colonoscopy. They went to get their butt checked for cancer. And the film came up with a little surprise friend. Um, yay. That's a trout with, I think, flukes. Oh, no, tapeworms, adult tapeworms. Um, and then the last one is another colonoscopy picture. There are a lot of colonoscopy pictures of parasites. Um, do you know what a colonoscopy is? You won't have to deal with it for another, like, 30 years. Sometime between 40 and 50, based on family history, they make you drink this stuff that cleans out your entire intestine in the course of about six hours, and then they shove a camera up your butt. You're sedated for the whole thing. It's really not bad. Um, and it's way better than dying of rectal cancer. My best friend died of rectal cancer. I'll take a colonoscopy any day. Um, they have actual video of up your butt. They look at the entire colon. And you can choose to be awake for that and watch the little screen. Most people have want no part of that. Um, that's the choice most people make. <laughs> Um, but, you know, if you want to see what's inside your body, I'm torn. I'm torn between, between that, wow, that's kind of cool, and no, I don't want to see that. So, anyway, uh, that's footage from inside somebody's colon. Well, there's n the, the goal is that when you have your colonoscopy, there's nothing in there. Because the stuff they give you to drink the 12 hours before your colonoscopy gets rid of everything. It's a rather unpleasant evening. Um, but... Sometimes they get footage with a parasite. If you didn't know you had tapeworms, you might wake up from your colonoscopy and be told, by the way, you're going to need to take a wormer. Because it's just like worming dogs and cows and sheep and goats. Um, humans have wormers too. <laughs> and your doctor can prescribe it. It's a couple doses and it all comes out your butt. So I, I will pause here for one moment. So the, the, the fact is, these things do things to ensure that their lifestyle, life cycle needs are met. 
So pinworms need to go from butt to mouth. They need to be transmitted from somebody's anus to somebody's mouth in order to complete their life cycle. Which means scratchy, fingered little kids handing you cookies. What does this mean if you have a small child at home? Don't accept their food. Don't accept their food. Use a nail brush. Nail brushes are your friend. Scrub their little fingernails with a brush because the eggs lodge under the fingernails. You don't have to get literal feces in your mouth. All it takes is a kid who's been scratching their butt handing you food. Anything that they're handing you where your hands are going to end up on your mouth. Like, oh, here's your ice cream cone. Can I take a look here? I'll hold your ice cream cone. And then, No, don't do it. Don't do it. They're disgusting little things. Um, yes. Did you go to the elementary and see little kids? No, I felt sick. Oh, okay. And you have me after lunch. Lucky you. Think yeah. about fifth period who has me before lunch. Lucky them. Um, so anyway, a lot of these parasites do things that specifically help them complete their life cycle. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about a couple things. Parasites made you who you are. <coughs> Why do we have skin rather than just a big old cell membrane? It's protecting us from things. It's protecting us from all manner of things. Why do we have a tear duct in the corner of our eye? It flushes out dirt. It flushes out bacteria. It flushes out pathogens. Why do we have mucus? It traps bacteria and pathogens and parasites. All these things made you who you are. They drove the evolution of species to end up with the creatures we've got in front of us today. You like, you like the system you've got? Think a parasite. Hopefully not by scratching your butt. Um, so parasites have driven the evolution of species. Now, the question is, can they also change ecosystems? Because that's really what we're here for. You do not have this slide. So you can write down some pieces. You can take a picture of it. There are actually parasites that cause morphological. What does morphological mean? Shape. Shape. Yeah, structural changes in their hosts. So you see that poor little frog? Does it look like it would move very well? No. So it's got like six legs, and a lot of them are coming off in the wrong places, and the legs it's supposed to have aren't necessarily completely well-formed. Um, so there were a number of these sort of extra special deformed frogs that started showing up in the 90s. Um, and they were found in Minnesota and they were found in a few sites out west. And immediately there was sort of concern about, you know, well, what's causing this? Is it some kind of pollutant? Is it, you know, radioactive waste? Is it, you know, toxic chemicals? Turns out this, this is a liver fluke. So when somebody says like, ah, it's just a fluke. They don't mean what I mean when I say fluke. Flukes are a type of flatworm parasite. They're a parasitic worm. And a lot of flukes go through multiple life stages. Um, there are a couple of them that... Um, darn it. Are involved in... They, they come through snails at some point in their life. So the eggs are in the snail's gut. And when the snail poops, the eggs end up in the water. Um, there are some that involve ducks. There are sheep liver flukes that end up in a sheep liver. Humans can be affected by liver flukes. This particular fluke has a lifestyle that goes from snail to frog to bird. So what has to happen for the fluke to go from frog to bird? Frog's got to get eaten. Frog has to get eaten, or it's a dead end. They have to end up in a bird to complete their life cycle. Well, interestingly enough, there are a number of aquatic birds that will opportunistically eat frogs if they can't get away. Oh, aquatic. This liver fluke. So the cardinals aren't going to go there. No, cardinals are seed eaters, pretty much. But um, things like great blue heron 
and other aquatic diving birds. Pelicans. Um, yeah, but not in the places we find these. It would must be like herons and cranes. These frogs, the liver fluke attaches to their limb buds as they're developing from tadpole to frog stage, and it causes deformations of the limbs, which means these frogs cannot get away, which means, guess what? They get gobbled up, which allows the fluke to complete its life cycle. Whoa, that's creepy. It gets, you want to hear something even creepier? Of course you do. So there are some parasites that cause behavioral changes in their host, and I would like to introduce you to Miss Kitty and her friend. Wait, can I have not in the same way. Not that parasite, not that. But we're going to talk about human parasite interactions. So what's wrong with that picture? The cat's not mouse. Um, well, it's more like the mouse is like giving nose kisses to the kitty. The cat's about to do what the cat's going to do. If we had like you know the next ten seconds, nothing good happens here from a cat from a mouse perspective. There is a parasite called Toxoplasmosis gondii. Has anybody here lived in a house where somebody was pregnant? So you remember your mom being pregnant with younger siblings or aunts or uncle, well, not uncles, um, aunts. You remember aunts being pregnant or big sisters being pregnant? Do you have a litter box? Okay. You know what they tell pregnant women about litter boxes? You don't change that, honey. Not until after the baby. You let somebody else change the litter box. Great question. Why? Because cats transmit a parasite called Toxoplasmosis gondii. It's, um, it's a single-celled organism. And, I mean, you could get it right now. You, 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 any of you, male, female, pregnant, not pregnant, you can get Toxo. But if a pregnant woman gets it, it can damage the baby. In the first trimester of pregnancy, it actually usually means fetal death and miscarriage. In later trimesters, it usually means neurological damage for the baby. Um, but not as serious. Well, the Toxoplasmosis gondii goes through two hosts, mice and cats. Humans are just sort of an accident. We're not one of its intended hosts, but we, we end up um, getting it sometimes. It's more common than you would think. So what's weird is that Toxo in mice changes their behavior. And you know what happens? They lose all fear of cats. Hi, kitty. Is that awkward? Sorry. See, Nathan's not here for me to make uncomfortable, so I have to pick on somebody else. Um, they completely lose their fear of cats. <laughs> they will rock right up to cats. They'll do that. Thus ensuring that the parasite gets transmitted to the cat. Isn't that creepy? Zombie mice being controlled by a parasite in their brain? Now you want to hear something stranger? You asked about human effects on parasites. There's been some early preliminary research, and they only, as far as I know, they only looked at women. Somebody can look this up and fact check me. Female humans affected with toxoplasmosis gondii have higher rates of suicidal ideation. That means suicidal thoughts. They suspect <coughs> that it's the parasite doing the same thing it does on the mice to humans. Though in women, it doesn't play out as like no fear of cats because most humans are not all that afraid of cats anyway. But it, <coughs> it still plays out in terms of mental alteration. It's creepy. It's downright creepy. Now, what, what happens if you get, if you're pregnant and you're a female and you contract toxo while you are pregnant. My uncle-in-law, my husband's uncle, <laughs> and he's 60-something, but he was the fifth of five kids. Like, nobody pays attention to number five, apparently. This is what I hear. <laughs> Things were a little bit rough for a while there. And, well, you know. <laughs> anyway, he went to sign up for the army when he was 18. Now, you guys get eye tests in kindergarten. My daughter got an eye test in kindergarten. They didn't do that stuff when he was a kid. 
he goes to sign up for the army at 18, and he, they tell him, well, you can't be in the army. You're blind in one eye. I'm what? You're completely blind in one eye. You've got almost no vision in one eye. He never knew. Whatever you're seeing seems normal to you. You know, he never knew that other people saw in greater depth than he did. He didn't realize that what he was seeing wasn't the whole picture. He's nearly blind in one eye. They tested him. He has toxoplasmosis. His mother contracted it when he was pregnant. When she, <laughs> when she was pregnant. He was never pregnant as far as anybody knows. I don't think Rich has a uterus. And I'm not about to ask him. He's not, he's not the kind of guy who would take kindly to a question like that over Christmas dinner. Um, so, but his, his mother, so my husband's grandma, contracted toxo when she was pregnant with him. It, it varies, the severity of the impact to the baby varies on when you contract it. So toxo contracted in like the first 12 weeks of the pregnancy almost always means death for the baby. Not, not survivable. In the middle of pregnancy, it usually means neurological damage, um, you know, cognitive delays, stuff like that. In the last part of pregnancy, the effects are not usually as serious, and it usually attacks the eyes. So it's a pretty good bet she contracted Toxo while she was pregnant with him towards the end of her pregnancy. Now, he got treated because, I mean, he still had the parasite at 18 because he had never been treated for it. But, you know, he got treated. He's fine. Do things like this change communities? If you've got prey species who are hopping right up to predators or can't get away from predators or, you know, skirting up to the cat or the coyote or whatever else, yeah. Mm -hmm. It changes the balance in those predatory relationships. It changes a lot. So here's the deal. The notes for competitive, commensal, and mutualistic. I will post the full slides. You're responsible for copying those yourself. The content was well covered by Hank. I like what he did with that. We don't need to go any further than he did. The project that I'm going to give you will not be due until Monday. You may have some time tomorrow. I'm going to let you get started. It posted to classroom. And we're going back to that Mill Creek, Lyme disease, deer, white-footed mice, and ticks thing. And you're thinking about those three species and all of the web of relationships that they're involved in, the predatory, the predator-prey relationships, the parasitic relationships, and the commensal, mutualistic, all of them, the competitive relationships. You and a partner, and I will probably, so Nathan's not here. Here's what I'm going to do, Skylar. I'm going to have you work up here with Lexi, and when Nathan comes back, and Maitland's also, and then I'll move Maitland back with you guys when she comes back. That works. Um, so we'll have two groups of three, and the rest are groups of two. You and a partner, so one of you has to open the document, save it to your drive, and then make a copy, I guess, and then share it, share it with your partner. And you're going to start working. Um, we'll walk through one example together. And like I said, they will be due Monday.